You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. We are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 25. You're welcome to open your Bible. I'll give you a minute to get there. If you don't have a Bible, we have one for you. We would love to share that with you. So um, check in with the Connect desk. They'll connect you to a Bible. Here we go. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For one who understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in tongues builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want to tell you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interrupts so that the church may be, uh, interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will, you benef- how will I benefit unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge of prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will give, get ready for the battle? So with yourselves, if your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker to a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue... My spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with the spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks uh, with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of the outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he doesn't know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you, many, more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but the unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for, belie- not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, the outsiders and unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophecy and unbelievers or outsiders enter, he is convicted by all. He is called to, a- to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. This is the word of the Lord. You can now have a seat, and the kids can be dismissed to their class. Hello. My name is Michael. I am one of the pastors here. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. You stand up here, Just, or you? Okay, cool. All right, cool. So we've been, we've been talking about spiritual gifts, uh, and we've kind of built out the goal of spiritual gifts. I, I want you to know this. This sermon is not uh, separated from the last months, last few chapters of the Bible that we've been looking at. So we've, we've kind of built out the goal as we've talked about spiritual gifts. We want to advance the mission of Jesus. That's what these gifts do, and, and they do other things, but we kind of uh, gave a definition of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are given to equip the church to carry out its mission until Christ re- returns. That last part's pretty important. That means that there's still stuff happening until Christ 
returns because that has not yet happened. <clears throat> we've talked about the, the goal and we've talked about the heart, kind of like where this all uh, leads to and where it comes from, that we are better together, that we are equipped and we are uh, being equipped, we are equipping uh, we are unified, we, we use these gifts, these uh, works of the Spirit, um, not to build our own identity, not to say how great we are or how better one of you are than the, than the other, but, but for the building up of the body, we are better together. And today, we get to lean into some, some details, right? Uh, big idea, the speaking gifts bring clarity to community through faith, love, love. And order. All right, the speaking gifts bring clarity to community through faith, love, and order. And so this is kind of like the climax of, of Paul's discussion uh, on, on the gifts uh, that, that started in chapter 12, just a couple chapters ago, where he said, Now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be uninformed. And we painted that out for us, like we don't want us to be uninformed concerning spiritual gifts either, all right? And so he kind of concludes today with this chapter and, and uh, the remainder of the chapter that we won't get to today, and, and he kind of leans into some instruction and practice around some speaking gifts, right? These include primarily prophecy and tongues, but we can also lump some other things in there, teaching and words of knowledge. And, and in the big picture, we can even talk about miracles and healing and other stuff that he's been talking about. So there is this vein of Christianity who say that these gifts, along with some others, that they are not for today. And you might be sitting there saying, that's me. I think that, All right? And I would tell you this, that's okay, All right? That, that is okay if that's where you sit today. Um, that person would call themselves, or, or we kind of uh, put, put that type of thinking in a category called cessationism. And so a person who would think that the gifts have ceased, they would, they would say, I'm a cessationist. Not a sensationist, but a cessationist, as if the gifts have ceased. They are no longer for us, which is why... I say we have to pay attention when we say the spiritual gifts are given to equip the church to carry out its ministry until Christ returns, right? So uh, to be clear, the village elders understand that position. And again, if you find yourself in that position today, that's okay, right? Um, I have been uh, what I would have described myself as uh, coming out of a hyper charismatic background into a Baptist background, into whatever we are, right? Um, I would say, I would, I would theologically say, now those gifts are for us, um, but I would say I'm a functional cessationist in the sense that some of these, uh, they're not on my radar week to week, right? That might be true for you. And, and what I'm inviting us into today is say, well, maybe they should be on our radar, week to week, day to day, okay? Um, so to be clear, the, the village elders have kicked this stuff around for a couple years, off and on, all right? And there's some documents swirling around, because that's what we do, and Scott wrote up a great document that we will probably get in your hands sometime sooner than later. Um, what I want you to know is, is that I get it, that we have wrestled with it, that I could defend the position, uh, I, I think, pretty competently, I could, dis I could defend the position uh, of cessationism. I could do that. And yet, we find ourselves unconvinced from the scriptures. Uh, that, that is to say that the Bible doesn't clearly make the case that these gifts have ceased. In fact, given my own experience and my own reservation in my own uh, biblical investigation and my own processing, and I take comfort in these words from Craig Keener. I'm going to quote him several times. He has a book called The Gift and Giver and some others. Um, uh, I encourage you to, to read some stuff. So, so this is helpful for me, and I, I think it might be helpful for us together. He says, although I've 
Heard of miracles such as those in Acts happening regularly in some places. I frankly confess that I have not witnessed miracles, uh, many miracles on that scale. I could seek theological rationalizations for this lack, contending that God simply does not want to do such miracles today. But seeking an argument to validate my experience would violate my commitment to read my experience in light of Scripture. Because I affirm that Scripture is God's Word, I must submit to it rather than make it say what is convenient. As a biblical scholar, him, not me, who by conviction determines the meaning of the text first and then asks its implications for today, I must conform my experience to the Bible rather than the Bible to my experience. All right, that, like this should be true for how we interpret all of Scripture, not just gifts in particular. In other words, I remain committed to spiritual gifts because I am committed to Scripture rather than the reverse. The Bible's message does not simply confirm my experience, my own experience of miracles or any other gift. It summons me to be more open to appropriate signs and wonders than I already am. Straight up, that's where you find me today. Right? That is to say that no one would read the Bible, cover to cover, shut the thing, set it aside and say, man, I'm glad that weird stuff's not for today. You, wouldn't, you would not draw that conclusion. You can get there, you just have to dance, right? You have to make the scripture dance. And so uh, that, that's where we find ourselves today. The Holy Spirit is not handcuffed by the scriptures. He's liberated by the scriptures. He works in super, natural, ordinary ways. And he works in supernatural ways. We read the Bible and we get to be convinced that God is, uh, is not merely working in the mundane. Although he is working in the ordinary. The, the just regular, we gather together, we live life in community, we, we open the book daily if we're able, right? And it's not, nothing magical in that day, but day by day he builds us up. Just the normal community of faith as we gather together, we sit under the word, we spend time in prayer, devotion to him, understanding him, and he works those things out in, in incredible ways in the ordinary, but, but not merely in the mundane and the ordinary. See, I once feared that the doctrines of grace, that is, we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, according to Christ's work alone, I once feared hinging my faith to this theology that said that it was all about God's work and what he's already done. And do you know what now? That is, that is the spring of life for me. And I believe, in some way, Secondarily to that, that, the same is true for the way that we get to walk in this life, being full of the Spirit, right? And He dwells in all of us who are in faith. I'm not saying anything crazy, right? We're not swerving hard any direction, but we're exploring what this has to say for us. I, I once feared the doctrines of grace, and, and now they're the, the springs of life, and I think this is true for the gifts of well. And, and if the Spirit still speaks, let Him speak, right? And, and certainly He speaks through His Word, and that's the only authoritative word that we have, and, and it's all that we need and sufficient for salvation and, and, a, and a life of godliness and the fullness of life. But he also speaks as comfort and as a missionary prompter and, and as, as a boldness giver and, and one that makes us better when we are devoted to him, walking in the fullness of power that we might advance his kingdom. How, how foolish we would, we would be to say that apart from the Spirit, man, I can, I can do all these things. We would, no one would say that. And yet we look at these gifts and we, we somehow set them aside and if all of this 
is, is true. If these are indeed gifts available, accessible, useful for the first century church, and we've no convincing reason to believe that they're not accessible and relevant and good and useful for building up and advancing the mission of Jesus in the same way today, then they are presumably for the village church today. Now, I'm not sure where this leaves you or where it finds you or if you've left by now. <laughs> but I presume that it, it leaves us at a crossroads that we either lean in and we ask, as I asked you all a month ago, we lean in and we ask with, with humble, willing heads, hearts, hands, God, what do you have for me? What do you have for us? Or we lean out and we reject the Spirit's offering, and, and maybe we even reject the Spirit himself. We engage the mission with the tools that he's equipped us to do, or, or we oppose the mission, or, or maybe at, at best, benefit of doubt, we just remain neutral, and we, we have uh, the tools and we're not using them. Or, or maybe you have been all along. You just wouldn't call it a gift from the Spirit. If you know anything about me, you know I love King of Queens, right? It's a 90s, early 2000s show, Doug and Carrie Heffernan, Arthur Spooner, right? There's this episode where Carrie's going through their pantry or whatever, and she finds a, a gravy boat. I think that is a dish that's used to serve gravy. Is that right? Gravy boat? I, I, don't, I don't get it. Anyway, so she opened it up. They'd been married for six years, and she, she opens it up, and she says, Doug, there is a check in here for $1,500. This was a wedding gift that we've never used, and here it is. And, he's, and they're like, wow, how are we going to, we're going to spend the money. They take it to the bank, and they can't, so they have to go, right, the show of the day. But the point is, they had $1,500 to set them up at the beginning of their marriage. It was there. It was in their kitchen all along, and they weren't using it. You tracking? I think we may do the same. I do the same. You may, you may not be there, but, but I think we are, <laughs> right? Um, staff meeting this week. Monday morning, we come together and we say, gosh, how big of a disaster are all those people? I'm just kidding. That's not what we say. <laughs> We come together, and we reflect, and we connect, and we direct, all right? And we say, hey, how was the weekend? How was the gathering? Anything crazy? What was going on? And, and in that, kind of, we, we drew some conclusions about uh, preaching, and it was, ah, like, ah, good anchoring stuff. Where it seems a little conservative in light of spiritual gifts, and like, you've said things, and Michael, but, but, but have you really said anything? And I said, well, I think so. I think I have. Uh, um, and, and it went like this, like, true, uh, we're, we're striving for biblical fidelity, so I'm preaching the text and not, not the text, and, and we're not merely just pressing things forward for the sake of pressing things forward out of context, but we're doing what Paul did in, in his response, and, and we'll get there, and today we'll talk about some stuff, right, and this is an ongoing conversation that we get to have in the class coming up in November. We create space for that to talk about some details a little bit more. All right, and, and we'll have other outlets to, to process this stuff. But a helpful thing came out of that conversation. See, Paul is correcting the overusage of gifts. You guys are like chaotic, crazy people, and you need to simmer down a bit because what you're doing is self serving. And what we're doing today is, is um, we're using the same text, but we're, we're pushing against the under usage of a gift. That's a, that's a good thing to be mindful of, right? Um, both miss over usage, uh, under usage, both miss the point the Spirit's still at work. He is gifting and speaking and advancing the mission that Jesus commissioned. The aim for Paul in his context to the original hearer of the words that he wrote is a correction against their abuse of the gifts. Today, we probably find ourselves more in line of a correction here towards the neglect of the gifts. <sighs> That's okay. I, I used an example last week of like, 
you don't get keys and the driver's license until like you learn the rules of the road and you say, hey, like when you're coming, when, when you're merging on the interstate, you got to look and you, you got to do all the things. And once you feel confident that your son or daughter can drive, you give them the keys and they get their license. But I think on the other side of that, we've probably had keys and we've probably had our license for a long time. Uh, and the car's just been sitting in the garage. Okay? So here's the fork in the road. You ready for it? I'm just going gonna, gonna to read a verse of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. I'm already out of time, just to let you know. Uh, it goes like this. Pursue love? Check. And earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Ah, I love the spirit. Especially that you may prophesy. Er. Like this, he says, give yourself to the gifts God has given you. Pursue love. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Especially that you may prophesy. You'll notice Paul is not making a suggestion. Um, He's encouraging the pursuit of spiritual gifts. If it said, pursue love, earnestly desire to crucify your sin, you'd be like, yeah, I, man, I just got to. And what this says is earnestly desire spiritual gifts and that you may prophesy. And you're like, well. See, the foundations are established. He's laid them. We've laid them together. Uh, we had to flip. We didn't, we're not preaching on chapter 13. Matt's preaching that next week because of some logistical stuff or whatever. And so uh, he's going to be preaching that next week. But he's, he's, he's landing the plane after building all this stuff out in mutual upbuilding. And it's for the common good. And, and we don't find our identity in any of these things. And these things are not first class, second class. It's not undercutting the perfect word, the, the authoritative, complete word of God it's not necessary for salvation. It's not uh, authoritative, but it is advancing the mission. These gifts, so this chapter contrasts prophecy and tongues, and it talks about some other stuff. It frames out their appropriate and good usage among the assembly or when the church is gathered, and, and it gives us some clues on when the church is scattered. So first, the, the idea of tongues, all right? Um, languages is the word, and you're like, is that real languages or is that what many call gibberish languages, right? I'll give you some examples of tongues in just a second. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. That would be a terrible idea. Languages. Supernatural ability to speak or hear and language unknown to the speaker, right? What Paul builds out is that it's largely private, like that's your thing, Unless there's an interpretation there, it's unintelligible, which means that you can't understand it, all right? And it builds you up. It builds oneself up, not the, not the body, not uh, the community. But even in that, Paul's not saying it's a terrible thing. He's just saying it, it has some limitations, all right? So is it a real language? Uh, it has been. We see that in Scripture, yes. Is it uh, an unknown language that may not be a real language? Yes. The answer is yes. Um, in Acts chapter 2, Peter seems to be speaking in his native language, and then everyone else hears it in their own language, which is different than him saying it in a language that no one hears, and, everyone he and, and one person here. And so what we, what we see is there's like a variety of the way that this shows up. All right? Do I have all the answers? I do not. But. One sweet thing. I love this. People overemphasize this and they say like, oh, it's uh, heavenly language and like clearly it's some wild stuff. And then everybody else would say, yeah, as long as it's a, a, an actual language, right? And, right? and we just don't know. And then some say, well, uh, like in chapter 13, Paul is kind of using this hy hyperbole, extreme exaggeration, maybe. And he says, whether you speak in tongues of angels or of men, and you say, ah, oh, there's the, the angelic language, but look, have you ever read the Bible about angels? And have you ever heard them say things that didn't make sense? No, the angels spoke in native, the native tongue of the people. So we see a couple things. God is not outside of language. And we see that all of this is a little difficult to draw a chart about, right? The other side of this, prophecy, right? 
uh, not fortune telling, prophecy, uh, crystal ball, got it. No, nope. right? You shouldn't think that. Uh, you should think uh, something along this line, De- delivering and intelligible, that means people can understand it, message that is received from the Spirit, not in conflict with Scripture, meaningful to the hearer for the building up and of God worship. Uh, one, uh, roughly one-third of the prophecies in Scripture are about future things. Certainly the coming Messiah, he has come, and, and certainly when he returns, or there are unfulfilled prophecies. That means that, that roughly two-thirds are about God bringing a word to a people for here and now, right? So the way Paul talks about these, they are primarily public intelligible, which means you can understand them. They build others up. They are distinct from Scripture and yet subject to Scripture. (sighs) So we can breathe. It's okay. Give yourself to the gifts God has given you. Well, how do I do that? And how do we do that together? First thing is this. Seek clarity, not chaos. Uh... 1 Corinthians 14, starting in verse 1. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. You're like, yes, right? It's not undercutting anything that Paul's already said. He's not saying there's literally a hierarchy, and if you prophesy, you are far better, and if you only speak in tongues, you are second class, an imposter. No. He said when the church is gathered, it's far better that you bring clarity, not chaos. Unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. How many times does he say this? that it's for the church and it's not for the individual. It's like, frankly, I'm sick of hearing about it. I'm just kidding. Um, Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? You read words in the Bible like predestination, and, and people in this room are like, yeah, there it is, right? But you know other people, they read words like that, and they're like, that just... Uh, honey, close his eyes. Act like that's not there. That's what we do for these words. Unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. Oh, teaching. We can get behind that. Isn't that funny, though? These gifts are, they're not for us, but teaching. Well, yeah. Uh, And when someone teaches the word, do they do it perfectly? They do not. If even lifeless instruments, he goes on, he talks about bugles and other instruments. Uh, He says, so with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? He's making a very sensible argument. For you will be speaking into the air. If you say things that don't make any sense, then you're literally just talking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestation of the Spirit. Here's the thing. Remember that corrective piece? Since you are so eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, many in this room, you're not. And so the corrective piece would selves be eager for the manifestation of the Spirit. And and as you do, be mindful of these things. So with yourselves, since you are eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Wow. Uh, He talks about a bugle sounding, right? 
speaking into the air, not bringing clarity to the troops. The, the context is battle, and if there's a sound that that horn makes, okay, that means go. What if, this, what if the bugle or the trumpet or the whatever makes another sound, then everyone's like, wait, was that it? Because I don't think, wait, does that mean retreat? Was that the retreat sound? What do we do? And then you start running around. That brings chaos, not clarity. That's what he's trying, or, or maybe uh, a little more sensibly, if, if there's a third base coach and he's given signs like this and the batter's looking back and he's like, okay. But he has no context for what the guy is doing over there. Then the batter's like, do I bunt? Do I, I, do I take? I have no idea. But the, but the coach knows he's actually <laughs> delivering messages and signs to him, but the batter has no idea. That brings chaos, not clarity. Keener goes on. He says this. Rather than revealing mysteries, the person praying in a tongue simply offers mysteries. That is a, a clarifier, if I've ever heard one. The purpose of the utterance is prayer to God, not to build up others. By contrast, prophecy serves the gathered uh, assembly directly. Although both are commendable, the former can be done privately rather than at the assembly's expense. You're not a big deal, Paul tells us over and over again. Care more about others than yourself. Paul regards the ability to pray in an unlearned language as desirable. But prophecy is more desirable because it serves the people. So Paul puts all the gifts in their place. If used in the public assembly, they were to be used only to serve the church. Look. The spirit, the, the spirit is the spirit of truth. He is eager to make Christ known through the church. And God is not a God of chaos, but, but longs to bring clarity anchored in truth of the knowledge of God. What an incredible opportunity and gift and responsibility that we get to pursue clarity of truth, not just for ourselves, but for others. And we get to pursue necessary gifts that, that the Spirit might use us, not just me, but us together to be used to bring clarity to others. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church, right? Seek clarity, not chaos. The second thing, strive to communicate, not to confuse. It's very similar to the first one. Let me read verse 13 and 14. We'll pause for a second. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. He's saying there is prayer where you are saying words with your mouth that your mind has no idea what's happening. And I know what you're saying. Like, I know what you, who are taking notes, and you have, like, perfectly bulleted, formatted notes that you're writing. I know you who have, like, I, I get it. I know you, you who haven't shed a tear because you're a separate from your emotions, and you say, all emotion is bad because emotionalism in the church is, I get it. And yet, he tells us there, there is a type of prayer where we're saying words that we don't understand, and that is a gift from the Spirit, not for everyone that we've already seen, but for some. I gave you an example I read uh, this week. A seminary student got into a loud debate with his Bible interpretation professor. Oh, I hate when that happens. And for the rest of the day, the student felt incomprehensibly threatened. He knew he needed to apologize to the professor for losing his temper, but why was the debate bothering him so much? On his own, he began to pray in tongues. And as his spirit defense mechanisms were no longer in a position to suppress his true feelings, 
As he poured out his heart in tongues, the Spirit also began to provide the interpretation for what he was feeling. He realized that he felt threatened by authority figures because he had always felt threatened by his father. He goes to his professor, he repents. His professor says, bro, we're good, right? That's great. But that was the easy part. He had to deal with his father. And he went to his father and he said, Dad, we need to talk. And the, the way the, the writer kind of painted the story out, it's like Dad's looking at a newspaper. What is it, son? You know? And he tells him this stuff and he confesses and he confronts him. And his dad seemed unchanged, like, okay, well, glad I did that. Dude leaves. A couple days later, his mom calls him, the son, and he says, what did you talk to your dad about? And he's like, oh, he, this, I just came since you left. And so he went and he chatted with his dad. And, and from that point on, they began to restore their relationship, move forward, and began to have a healthy father-son relationship for the remainder of their days. Is that what praying in tongues looks like? Is that the fruit of praying in maybe, right? I don't know. I wasn't there. But that seems like the Spirit praying through him brought him to a place that, that that became a gift. It was between him and the Lord, and it diffused his situation and even processed for him. This is what the person, the Holy Spirit, did for him. So we read on, verse 15. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak tongues more than all of you. Okay, it's cool. It's fine. You don't know. You don't know me. Um, nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than ten thousand words in a tongue. Seventh grade volleyball teaches the point, right? In volleyball, the goal is to score more points than the other team, right? You hit it over there. Now, seventh grade, players are, you know, like maybe have never played volleyball before, and so it doesn't quite look like it should. The goal is to, to win, to get more points. What happens is the other team serves, and uh, the ball crosses the net, and it hits the floor. And then the two players look at each other and like, ah, that's no good. Give it another shot right? No communication, no words, no good, no help at all. The serve comes over, right? The, the second time, uh, maybe one receives the ball. They receive it. They pass it to the setter who's nowhere to be found. No one fills in. No one says anything. No one communicates. No help. No good at all. The ball hits the ground. Maybe another scenario. The ball comes over. The person bumps it, right? Someone, uh, the setter says, help. Hey, that's good. Uh, two people come over, they collide in each other, the ball hits the ground, neither one of them called it right. You get the idea. Someone calls it, and the other person comes and hits it from them. As a parent, super frustrating to watch. But the point is, man, good volleyball, like, like good volleyball, ball comes over, hit, setter, calling out what's going to happen. Everyone understands their role. They're communicating properly. They're yielding to one another. They're listening. They're submitting to when someone calls something, saying or doing anything. Uh, they, they offer grace. They're engaged. This is the church when, when the gifts are working properly. And what we get to do is we get to strive to communicate, not confuse, certainly on the volleyball court, but also in... Uh, in this life that we get to live together as the church, this is for unity, for the building up of the church, and, and, and for uh, God to be known, treasured, and worshipped above all. So what of tongues with interpretation? What does that look like? Because it seems to be saying that there's space for that when the church is gathered. Uh, sure. Sure. Do, do I get it? Do I, do I know exactly what that would look like? I do not. Am I submitted to the scriptures more than my own experience or understanding? I am. Sam Storms, super helpful. 
Acts 29 pastor, one of the oldest guys in the networks, right? Theologically, he lands where we do as a church, but, but he is not just a, uh, an understander of the gifts, but he's a practitioner of the gifts. He cultivates a church where these gifts are on display. And so I encourage you, hey, like type in Sam Storm spiritual gifts, and there's a million things, right? You're welcome, right? Bingles play at one, so you got to work around that. He suggests, man, working this stuff out in small groups. Like when you read things like, uh, like at the end of this chapter, there's all kinds of like uh, specific things that he says, what, this is what order looks like. But you don't know who's in the room or who has what gifts. And so he's saying like experiment in small groups with, with grace being full. Right For us, we have worship nights where we're the, a little less attended and we have space to just pray, less declared, and more space. And so like, there is space for this stuff to happen. Is there room for failure? Maybe. Is there room for correction after the fact? I think so. But, but as we seek to shine light on Christ and not us, man, we're, we're a community that's We've always been fueled by grace, and we get to continue to be that. The the gifts are given to point to truth through the spirit of truth, submitted under truth to form people of truth. Pursue the gift of tongues. I mean, if you pray in tongues, seek also that you would interpret, because that's what the Bible says. If you prophesy, seek to submit to Scripture and, and to ones who might be able to discern uh, the spirits or, or the nature of your prophecy uh, practically. That might look like you being moved in a, in a way that, that you can't shake a thought. There's probably a thousand ways that that could show up like. And, and you coming back to... Uh, to one of the red trees and saying, look, I, I don't know if this is for, I, I don't know what this is, but I have this thought and I can't shake it. And it might be that these people need to hear it. And we get to talk through that and figure that out. Do we have a flow chart for that yet? We do not. Does that make me uncomfortable? A little bit. That's all right, I think. Um, for you in your life, it might look like approaching somebody after a community group gathering, saying, hey, when you're talking tonight, man, I just had, I, I don't know, I, I, I just have this thought I want to share with you. And it may be nothing, right? But I, I just can't let this go. And so I want to share that with you. Do with it what you, in humility, without the authority of assurance or promise, I want to share something with you. Here is what it is. Therefore, I would rather speak five words and 10,000 words in a tongue when the church is gathered for the building up of the church. Lastly, this. Serve maturely, not childishly. The rest of this chapter, it it says, be about the building up, maybe two or three, like very practical. When when a person is is, uh, speaking in tongues, maybe two, maybe three at a time, but only if there's someone there to uh, interpret. If someone's giving a a prophecy, uh, let... Uh, two or three prophets speak and let others weigh their words. It's very pre- He did it. It seemed like he did have a flow chart. I don't know. Um, when revelation is spoken, take turns. Prophesy one by one. The prophets are subject to the prophets. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Rightfulness, it's awareness. It, I, I, it seems like what Paul's saying is um, read the room. He talks about believers and unbelievers. He's saying, man, is the, this is good for those who, but, but if they come in and you, you don't, you're not saying anything, they're going to think these people are lunatics, right? That's what, that's what he says. Read the room. Unclear, non-communicating, gibberish doesn't build up. In fact, it, it demonstrates a lack of maturity in the way that you're engaging the assembly. We get to be rooted and we get to be mindful and we get to read the room. Here's the thing. We know what maturity looks like at a sixth grade, uh, a six-year-old's birthday party. We know what immaturity looks like. 
And what he's saying is, man, don't be immature in the way that you love one another, in the way that God uses you to, to build one another up. I'm going to give a, a couple examples. I knew a guy, remember I became a Christian in a very charismatic, some would say we're all a charismatic, and that's okay, that's why I always say hyper charismatic church, right? Pentecostal church, maybe, but I also believe that Acts 2 happened and that was the day of Pentecost, so am I Pentecostal? Sure, by those, by, by those words, right? So hyper charismatic, that is to say order wasn't the, the tone of the day, right? Um, you, would get in, you would go into that gathering, you'd be like, what is happening? I knew a man devoted as they come, honest to goodness, a, a servant of Jesus, if there ever was one. And I saw him dozens and dozens of times stand at an altar and weep tears, praying that God would give him the gift of tongues. Because in that context, that was the assurance of your spiritual uh, vitality. And he never received that, to my knowledge. And, and it stifled him, and he felt like a second-class follower of Jesus. I've known many in a context like that who, who ask for healing, physical healing for uh, a loved one. They don't get it. And in many contexts like that, they are assumed to have weak faith. And if you had only believed, then God would surely have done Right? That's devastating. I've, I've known people who claim God's prophetic word, and they say, hey, this is a word from the Lord. This, God said that you're going to have a baby. And they never had a baby. So who do they turn their anger towards? God, who said. So, I infuse where these anointed men of God would come in, not from the church, from, you know, like a, a, an evangelist type. They, they would come in, and they would be preaching, and dead in the middle of their preaching, they would say, young man, stand up. Sorry, camera people, Mark, just put it up there. And I would, and I would, I would stand up, and he would speak some word over my life, a couple times before I was even a Christian. This is a different view down here. Wow, that's great. Wow, a little intimidating. Um, young man, you're going to do great things, and the Lord's going to use you ten times. Now, did I go home and write the date on my mirror and the word that he spoke, and every time I leave the bathroom, I tap that and say, it's today that I didn't do that. Did I think, like, that was weird? I did think that. Is, is this that work? I don't know. But what I believe is, as we seek the scriptures and we submit to them, and in a day like today, we say, God, what, what do you have for us? Right? Right? Um, if you ask and you don't get, you're not broken. God is seeing his mission through perfectly. We get to thank him for what role we do get to play. And we get to thank him for the role that he gives others to play. We get to ask him and, and let you, uh, we get to ask him to let us play whatever role that he has for us and trust that he will gift you perfectly to do his perfect will. All right? I'll throw this up on the screen, a couple things that we get to be mindful of, right? Take a picture of that because I want to close the team, right? As, as, as if we're confused about the mission of any of these gifts uh, that they send us on immediately after addressing the muddy waters of abuse or neglect of the speaking gifts, he turns the corner to remind us of our only hope of which we submit all of these gifts to the mission before us to boldly believe and to boldly make known this Gospel. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. Remember, he's just talking about all that we've just been talking about. Of the gospel I preached to you, of, of which you received, in which you stand, 
and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. He's saying all that stuff, it matters. You know what matters most? This, that Christ died for your sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and he appeared. In community group this week, uh, the band can come on up. Uh, Adam Jacob, he said, the gift of knowing that death is dead, the gift of knowing death is dead is the link to us viewing God with eyes that can see him uh, do things bigger than we could ever imagine. This is it. If Jesus busted out of a tomb after carrying your sin, your shame, your guilt, burying it, coming back to life to give us life, if that happened, then surely he can use us to advance that good news mission. Why do these gifts matter? Because the gospel matters? Because renewal matters? Because your neighbors saved and unsaved matter? Because this city of Jesus? Because truth matters? The net is deep and wide and the spirit is full and grace abounds. The speaking gifts bring clarity to community through faith, love, and order. And we get to respond to that however you would like. Sit Stand, prayer bench, pray with someone who would love to pray with you. We get to remember and declare this good news of Jesus, that he came, that he lived, that he died, that he rose, that he ascended, that he sent the Spirit, that he reigns, and that he will return. And we get to do that by taking communion, right? That represents his body that was broken for us, his blood that was spilled for us. And may we pray today with humble minds, hearts, and your word. Thanks that we get to sing to you and about you and we get to gather under your word and we get to learn together with you humbly. We get to make mistakes, but we get to see you advance your mission of making much of Jesus. Would you let us be a church that does that today and until you return in the fullness of all that you offer us using all, every tool that, that you equip us with, would you let us do that? Jesus' name.